yeah, without any further ado, let's get started and introduce our fantastic guest, Thimali Kodikara, who, among other things, is producer and presenter on the Mothers of Invention podcast, which is a fantastic podcast, which we're going to listen to a little extract from in a minute. So I'm not sure how much I need to say about it um, ahead of that. I know some of you might have already listened to a whole podcast conversation between Thimali and me. Sorry, we're not going to listen to part of the Mothers of Invention podcast. We're going to listen to a podcast in which Thimali and I discuss the Mothers of Invention podcast. You should definitely listen to the Mothers of Invention podcast too. Um, we're going to listen to a 10 minute extract from it because we know that some of you will have listened to that whole podcast and others won't. But before we do, Thimali, please just, uh, do you want to say a word about uh, how are you feeling today and anything else you want to, uh, to do to greet the people? Well, I do. I'm super excited to be here, Kath. And uh, I know we, you and I have sort of been plotting doing this for a little while, um, but I'm just really excited that so many people um, are committed to climate justice and more specifically to hearing me rant away for the next hour. So um, thanks for joining and I hope you enjoy this uh, pod excerpt. So whenever you're ready, Charlotte, let's listen to the first 10 minutes of this conversation. So this introduces a lot more about Thimali and also about the Mothers of Invention podcast and why we think it might be highly relevant to higher education today. Lovely. I'll just set this up. Let me know if it's working. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Institute for Social Justice at York St John. This is one of the first in our exciting series of podcasts, Conversations in Social Justice. And for this podcast, we are talking climate justice. And we have got, I think, one of the best people we could possibly have to interview to talk about this. And I'm going to introduce her in just one minute. First of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Catherine Heinemeyer. I'm lecturer in arts and ecological justice at York St. John. And I was told you can interview anybody you like for this podcast interview. And because it was climate justice I wanted to talk about and the implications that has for curriculum at York St. John, I went straight to my very favourite podcast, which is called Mothers of Invention. First of all, it's a brilliant title for a podcast. I discovered this podcast right at the beginning of lockdown. And probably like a lot of you, I wasn't feeling great at the beginning of lockdown. The world seemed to be imploding. And not just because of COVID, it felt like COVID was coming on top of a whole set of layers of other global crises, poverty, inequality, racism, climate change running away with itself, ecological crisis. This podcast, when I discovered it, it was a massive thing for me because what it does is it assembles stories, interviews with people from the grassroots right up to CEOs and presidents of countries who are actually doing things about climate justice at scale. They're innovating. They are coming up with solutions from the front lines. They're people who are having to deal already with the consequences of climate change and climate injustice. And that's why they're the ones who are coming up with really great solutions. This podcast, just to give you a brief idea, within the first couple of series, I learned about Solar Sister in Africa, which is finding employment as well as community energy for rural communities. I heard about women working within the US evangelical Christian culture to bring climate justice conversations there, about people taking their governments to court for not taking action on climate change and winning, people who are innovating in circular economy in the fashion industry, creating models of fashion that don't create waste, people creating green jobs and green businesses with the most marginalized communities, people learning from indigenous people. I could go on and on and on. Basically, this stuff is all already happening. These stories are all there for us to learn from. And I feel like this podcast gathers them all together. So today, to finally now introduce my guest, this is Timali Kodikara, who is one of the presenters and also the producer of the series of Mothers of Invention. She co-presents with the former president of Ireland, Mary Robinson, and with comedian Maeve Higgins. Timali and Maeve both live in New York and Mary is all over the place because she's one of the elders of the United Nations and is a, a warrior for climate justice. 
So as I say, this podcast has been a fantastic discovery for me as an educator, and I'm so delighted to welcome you here, Tamali, so that you can share some of it with other people in the York St. John community and anybody else who might be listening today. Well, Catherine, how do I frame that introduction and hang it on my the wall of my tiny Brooklyn apartment? <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> you know, I'm usually making the podcast, I'm not on the other side of it. So this is a um, very special moment for me and slightly uncomfortable, but I will suffer through it in your good company. So I'm very excited. Thank you for having me. It's a first for both of us. So we're, we can look <laughs> after each other. I find climate justice a difficult thing to define. Can you can you tell us how you understand that term? Yeah, climate justice is the human rights aspect of climate change. So, you know, when we discuss climate, certainly in, you know, in the global north context, we try and sort of commit it to numbers and statistics and a lot of very heavy data, which is all incredibly important and incredibly relevant. But as Mary often puts, you know, she doesn't understand why the image of climate change is always, you know, a polar bear. She's like, I love the polar bears, but also it really should be sort of an indigenous woman working barren fields with no access to clean water sources or available water sources. And, you know, with an enormous family of children to look after and no husband because he's gone to work, you know, hundreds of miles away in the closest city because they can't grow food on their land anymore. Like that is the guts really of what we're trying to discuss on the show is, you know, how climate change is deeply affecting communities and in particular black and brown and indigenous women, girls, gender non-conforming folk who are existing on the front lines of those issues. As you've brought up, we still think about in the global north, we think about climate change as something that will happen in the future. But in actuality, it's been happening for generations already to all kinds of communities all over the world. So we're trying to address that and recognize that talent, creativity, intelligence, genius live in all factions of society. And therefore, it goes to say that obviously these people who are existing on the front lines of the climate crisis have the best, most holistic solutions for us to be engaging in and listening to and learning from. It sounds so obvious, really, when you put it like that. And yet, um, as I'm sure we'll go on to discuss that isn't really the face of the climate movement a lot of the time that most people would immediately think of. But tell me first a bit about yourself. I have worked out from one of the podcast issues that you and I are exactly the same age because we both... (laughs) I'm not like outing you here because you already put it on the podcast. Oh no, please do. Yeah, I'm not not afraid of age, yeah. (laughs) We both had our 40th birthdays at the very beginning of lockdown. But tell me a bit more about yourself and how you came to be interested and involved in climate justice issues? Well, the truth of the matter is I had absolutely no idea about climate issues when I started working on the show. That's not entirely true, actually. I knew all the key bullet points, Paris Climate Agreement, but my issue was always racial justice, intersectional feminism, immigration advocacy and reform, those felt so much more apparent and still do in many ways. You know, those are the issues that I deal with on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. I'm sort of trying to maneuver those things constantly. But I actually had a friend who worked in immigration reform in New York, South Asian friend, Sri Duncan friend, actually. And she was a really big deal in, in immigration and had quit her job to work in climate. And everybody, all of us in the community, were like, what are you doing? Like, climate is a white people's issue. Like, what do you mean? What do you do? What's happening? You know, really didn't understand the connections at all, but really respected her and, and so sort of kept it in the peripheries. And it wasn't until I was invited to come and work on the show that I really sort of had to do my digging around and understand how I could possibly augment this show because I joined in season two season one is actually launched out of London but the executive producers were like no it's got to be you and I'm like why why is it got to be me I don't understand but actually it was Mary who helped me make the connection really early on because I, I went to her and I asked you know people seem to be using the terms environmental justice and climate justice interchangeably 
do you do the same thing? She was like, well, no, they are two very different issues because climate refers to the existential crisis that is is occurring on planet Earth. And it clicked into place for me just immediately that that it was going to be black and brown people that were going to be affected most directly and most quickly. And then making the connections that like, oh, this has already been happening. And oh my God, yes, my own family, my my aunt was killed in a tsunami in 2004. I watched family in Sri Lanka, you know, dealing with floods. Season two, very quickly after I started working on the show, we had the former president of the Maldive Islands on the show, which is just, you know, right there next to Sri Lanka. So all everything started connecting very, very quickly. But it's very important to me to help people make those connections in the way that I did. But I think we can also, the show sort of benefits in that we're all learning together. And what's brilliant about having someone like Maeve is that she actually verbalizes the questions that we feel that the audience is thinking, but maybe feel too embarrassed to ask. So um, I love how yeah. she does that. Yeah. And I love she's that. our secret weapon, definitely. <laughs> she yeah. really is. Yeah. And I love, as well as the longer episodes where you have mothers come on, mothers of invention, you also have these mini sodes, these mini episodes where you and Maeve explore things that could be how to discuss climate with your climate skeptic relatives, or how to write yeah. a letter to your MP, or how to sue your government. And you lay yeah. it all out in 10 minutes <laughs> while going for a walk down the streets of Brooklyn. I love that atmosphere of those shows. Yeah, well, the sort of strategy with the mini sodes, and it is a very strategic show, actually, is because we, you know, we, I develop an editorial strategy for the show, but simultaneously we develop a social justice impact strategy it makes the show very, very unique. So within the full episodes, we're really sort of doing a lot of thinking, trying to get people to really engage in. Thank you, Charlotte. Yeah, you got cut off in mid-sentence there, Thimali, but um, it's all in the interest of us having plenty of time to uh, continue our discussion here in real life. Um, okay, so that's as far as we got in our in our podcast. And today we want to really open it up to you for your questions and discussion, either through the chat or in person, just raise a hand at any point. But we want to explore the relevance of some of the themes there to York St. John, to how we teach, how we learn. And I wonder, Tamali, you've spoken to so many mothers of invention, innovative women from all over the world about their climate solutions, about the things they're developing and innovating. Do you want to muse a little bit about what the world, we, we always talk about 2050, we want to have got to we want to have have um have got to carbon neutrality by 2050. What the world might look like by 2050 if we pay attention to these mothers of invention, if we follow their example, learn from them, build on what they're doing. Yeah, yeah, 2050. I think I'm going to be quite saggy in my rec <laughs> recliner, um, you know, perfecting my my recliner drum and bass moves. Hopefully, fingers crossed. But for the young people who are listening um to the show now you know we i wrote this mini sode for um to exit out of our season three which was quite full-on it was in the middle of the you know global pandemic and blm happened and all these these mad mad things and i live in new york that's where i'm speaking to everyone from now and the last four years have been traumatizing beyond belief and so that that moment um was you know the possibility of a dystopian future for us was actually just a hair away, you know, very, very palpable. And so, um, you know, we make these, these mini sodes, which is sort of these fun action oriented community centric 10 minute learning opportunities. And the very last release that we wanted to have, um, we released two days after the US election. So the result hadn't come out, but we sort of knew that everyone would be feeling this intensity. And, as a team, we realized that we, we wanted to help people visualize um, something beautiful because we are so oriented around the dystopia, um, the, the, the misery, the destruction. Um, and for a lot of people that does work, that does motivate. But I would say in our experience, um, usually, um, optimism optimism can do an awful lot be extremely powerful so i got the whole team together 
we figured out amongst us, we had a big Google Doc sheet, like what, what would a climate just future look like for us you know we we listed all kinds of amazing that just really went nuts with it you know and in in that um script i wrote in you know the possibility of a indigenous woman president or growing fruit trees or vegetable you know vegetable plots on the sidewalks and the pavements like why not right just why not as we're visualizing what could be possible why not just go there um, and I, I want to encourage everyone listening to do the same thing, like create a giant mood board and do the same thing because, you know, during, since then we've just, uh, you know, our first appointed U S interior secretary has been, um, appointed, uh, Deb Harland. Um, she is an indigenous woman from New Mexico. She will be in charge of taking care of the conservation um and management of federal lands and natural resources that's the first time we've got an indigenous person managing that in the united states you know um that tomato plant story came about because a friend and i was sitting on her stoop and we noticed a, a tomato plant randomly growing in a tree pit in her um in her pavement we're like this is mad like we should take care of it and we nurtured it and grew it and the, a week later, we were sat on the stoop and a homeless man what, rolled up in a wheelchair and it was delighted, just started picking tomatoes off the plant, putting them in, in his lap and just rolled away, happily chomping away on these on these tomatoes. You know, I've seen mutual aid uh, refrigerators popping up all over the neighborhood in my, over here. So um, imagining, like visualizing what a beautiful inclusive climate safe climate just a future could look like i think is um so much so much the battle and we can make it whatever we want it to be it's your future you know it belongs to you um but think big what is the point of being artists if we if we can't do exactly that visualize the future from outside the boxes that everyone else is functioning in we are very very powerful in that regard so so you're seeing lots of reasons for hope in this current moment. Um, I do. Yeah, I absolutely do. And I think um, I've realised what an enormous privilege it has been for me to enter into this conversation, the climate conversation, um, where I'm working on solutions all day long. Lots of people work on um, climate and have been working on, you know, really... Um, really having to suffer through um, the data and statistics, whereas oh, I'm in an environment surrounded by women and gender non-conforming folks, and we're you know of colour. We all um, are attached to other movements, and we really um, believe and can see and visualise what could be possible. You know, that's the sort of advantage I think in in this movement specifically is that there is a place for everybody and um yeah and 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 a lot of scope for innovation so i almost don't want to ask the second half of that question but i will and let's not get stuck there you know yeah. 2050 so many of the students we currently have at york st john will only be around 50 years old then they'll be maybe doing the best work of their careers but you know if we don't if if we don't learn from and give power to um, the mothers of invention, the ones on your show and all the others in the world, um, what world might we be in then at that point? Um, I think we all have a pretty grim idea of what that future could look like. And um, it's important for us to acknowledge what those things could could be for us, but let's. But the other thing we have to acknowledge is, um, you know, we we do know we already know what it's going to look like because the scientists are telling us. And if you want actual living examples, um, all of you can speak to any or all of the global South women on our show who are already living through it and surviving it. Um, so unless you live in a global North centric world, um, we already know, 
we already know how dystopian and um uh and you know oppressing it could be so uh, but, yeah but i was gonna say we you know we we rarely sort of motivate for for misery and i think um you know but in we want to be able to we only want to save things that we can relate to really yes in any context yeah um and i think that's particularly the case in global north cultures you know we don't have to experience misery for the most part if we don't want to you know we if we get ill we go to the hospital we get fixed up we go home that isn't the case for a lot of people um in other parts of the world and so i think you know being able to recognize that whatever is happening to folks in global south nations and other marginalized parts of the world um, is at, in fact happening to us as well is a really important part of the way that we start um, moving into solutions. Yeah, yeah. One more question from me before I throw it open to questions from everyone here. Um, what you've just said and what you were talking about in that extract from the podcast that we listened to ties really closely into the idea of decolonizing the curriculum and this is um, a really important priority for York St John at the moment there's several people who have come into this call who are really integrally involved in that um, such as Matthew Reason who's the uh, chair who's the director of the Institute for Social Justice um, what how, how can an understanding of climate justice what can an understanding of climate justice bring to that discussion about how to decolonize the curriculum? I really think it has to happen the other way around. Uh -huh. I think it's time, I, you know, England sort of discovered for the first time that it's a racist nation. <laughs> so, um, and a part of that, so, well, all of that is to do with the fact that we haven't had an education on these issues in the first place. You know, we, I, I went to great schools in, in England, in London, and um, we didn't learn a single word about the British occupation. Um, otherwise known as the British Empire, uh, which occupied 23% of the world's population um, violently for almost 200 years. Um, England, for the most part, do doesn't know that it invented the slave trade, doesn't know that it, uh, you know, gen genocidally caused the deaths of 4 to 12 million people in India. Like, we're not taught any of those things in school to understand the context behind a lot of climate justice issues. But, you know, when you've got someone like, you know, Modi in India, who is, you know, there's questionable in so many regards, but, you know, when India makes the point, like, why should we make all these changes um, in our life and lifestyles um, to adapt to, you know, to climate change, when quite frankly, in the global north, certainly in the United Kingdom, People have been benefiting off of our labor and our resources um, for generations already. And now you're telling us that we need to change our behaviors. So um, if we want to, um, you know, really contribute to this global community um, and support, um, we have to acknowledge our histories in full, like we have to. It affects absolutely everything. And to say that it just sort of happened and it's done is just such, um, it is so untrue. It's so incredibly untrue. It still plays out in so many people's lives today. So, um, you know, I think Diara Tucano, for example, is another example I would bring up in terms of that. She was a guest. She opened our season three, actually. Um, you know, again, we're just sort of entering into COVID and she's experienced all this COVID death. and. Um, but she talked about very clearly about what colonization um, by the Portuguese had done to her community. And there were thousands of tribes um, across Brazil, and now they're in the sort of small hundreds. Um, but, you know, she made the point that there's only only five percent of the world's indigenous people are left on the planet at this point. But they still protect 80 percent of the world's biodiversity. So, you know. All of these things have context, and I just don't 
think that it can happen the other way around where we try and you know I, speak to these issues um because it, it just it can't come from a genuine place and again the most important thing is that we develop holistic solutions um and the only way you can do that is by em fully empathizing with the most marginalized people in the room thank you so much lots to think about from that so i'd like to uh, open it up now to questions from anybody here you can raise a hand or you can post them in the chat nicole yeah Hi, Nicole. Um, I really liked what you were saying about like the optimism and having a positive outlook and like imagining what the future can be like. But I know that I've struggled with it and a lot of people of like having such an awareness of the climate crisis and feeling in crisis and feeling like you can't do enough to help it. Is there anything you could like tell us or anything you've done that helps you deal with feeling like that? yeah it's thank you so much for your question and actually you're not the first um young person that's asked me that question um first of all um hats have hats off to you all you know it's already such a um emotional uh you know taxing position to be in um but the level of motivation like i i just think that young people are just so, like the smartest most brilliant most energetic um generation i've i've ever seen they're just incredible you're like you you are part of a community that, that are going to do incredible things despite it not being it shouldn't be a responsibility it shouldn't um but the, the part of the reason why i'm so impressed with youth movements is because um they they are thinking about everything holistically in a way that generations before you um, really sort of struggle with identity politics and all of the things that we're discussing about justice. Um, they're not integrated into our generations. They're sort of more contrived. Um, but your generation are just getting on with it. And so much of that, um, you know, th there's a, a big effort to make sure that um self-care is integrated into that work and i i you know wholeheartedly believe that it's really important that you all re take really good care of yourselves as you do this work you are probably going to be in it for a long time um you know share take care of each other you know all, all of those things but in terms of the anxiety itself um it is it is hard like i can't tell you it's not it's not hard it is overwhelming but um the support is there and the support is growing rapidly i promise you it is growing rapidly and it is global so you're not on your own <laughs> i'd like to underline that I, my experience of the climate movement over the past three or four years has been a lot of it about learning from people 20 years younger than myself and I didn't expect that. Yeah. Those things that you've just been talking about, those practices of mutual care and of, of really paying attention to building cultures within groups, within learning situations that are supportive and nurturing and sustaining of people. I mean, the, the organisational strategies are just phenomenal. I'm like, where did you get this from you know you're like 17 years old like how do you know this you know but they they're really really on top of it and have found ways to adapt it because they know that this is going to be the long haul and unfortunately you have got older generations who are working against you but but i am you know so impressed at how adaptive this generation is it's amazing absolutely amazing Matthew. Hi, thank Hi, you. Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Hi, thank you for the, the podcast and participating in that. It was a, a great listen to Marley. Um, I want to, following on really from that point there around, um, and I think your phrase was motivating forces or you know what, what motivates people to, to do things. So as a, a context, I teach a, a module to theatre and dance students and it's on politically engaged practice and obviously ecological environmental issues are, are part of that. 
And I remember this year, um, I deliberately, and this came from, from some work I was doing with Kath, we were putting together a you know proposal looking at, well, what's the, the two sides of that coin around, around horror about prospects of what might happen and, and hope and the need for hope. And I kind of tried to weave that into it. And I just remember this year, quite a visceral reaction from a fair number of students against the notion of hope. Their, their, their language was, isn't that a little bit patronizing? Isn't that, you know, we get told to be hopeful all the time, even slightly just some of the you know, notions you're having there about youth and young people and hope and so on. And it, they were, I, was, I was slightly surprised and I didn't quite know what to do with that in the space of the moment. You know, how do I, you know, they're, they're pushing back against hope. What, what, what hope do we have left then? And I was just curious about that as a motivating factor. And I guess just attaching that on, Another one is, is, which comes up a little bit, particularly in the decolonizing the curricula conversations for, 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 for white people, is notions of guilt. And is guilt a motivating factor or the opposite? And how do we negotiate that? So I'm just really curious about your, your thoughts, I guess, on, on both of those and, and that experience. Have you ever had that experience of people pushing back at you and saying, well, stop telling us to be hopeful? Um, and what, what's the limit of that as a narrative in a way? Yeah, I love that you brought that up, Matthew. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is a very controversial um, point because um, certainly in the in the you know climate Twitter world, it has been sort of ripped to shreds. Like, no, you know, optimism isn't a thing because it is co very condescending to people who um, really have no hope. Like, we we had a guest on the show, Ursula Rakova, who lives in the Carter Islands off the coast of Papua New Guinea, and she is working on migrating her entire indigenous community. To a main, to a mainland, you know, and and how do you talk to her about hope? Like, what what on earth is that, you know? Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with that too. Uh, the problem with working with Mary Robinson is that she insists um, on re-emphasizing the importance of of optimism, um, and I think it sort of has evened itself out. Um, that this conversation around hope and optimism, um, because we, again, I think, are better motivated by possibility. And I don't think if you speak to anyone who works in climate, um, including yourself, maybe, you know, it's it's a struggle and it's sad and painful and all these things. But we still stay in it because we do fundamentally believe that things can still change and so that's the seed that we're all sort of gripping onto and I think that is valuable and I think that's worth it that's 100% worth it um I hope that answers that part of your question um in terms of white guilt um could you repeat that part of again for me actually about the white guilt issue Pressing the wrong buttons between um, hands up and <laughs> mute them. Um, well, it comes from from so so one of the one of the per, you know personal experiences around listening to those the, the the and and hearing the powerful kind of accounts from people of color around you know simply that that reversal from from my childhood where obviously the empire even even then was you know we would we would Nelson's a hero in all of roads the, and bridges. Yeah, my, my my school was divided. My school was a you know it's a state secondary model module um, school, but we still had houses which were named after um nelson grenville yeah. wade and wolf you know all military you know so so that shift of then you know actually okay it's not empire it's occupation that the, the 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 feeling of that is is a is a kind of is a kind of guilt and there's a very interesting german um performance piece called called guilt factory which is about the notion um that what is is guilt uh, an energizing force you know so so the i won't explain the piece but essentially it's interested in in, in does guilt inspire people to do good, as in all sorts of ways, be activist, give to charity, donate, or does guilt have the opposite impact? Is, is guilt a motivating force for good or not? And I'm just, I'm, I'm curious within, and I don't have a solution to this, and I doubt anybody does, within that discourse, does it, do, does it, does it have a, an impact, a motivating force in any direction? Um, does it stimulate change? Is it useful? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> my argument with, with that would be that white guilt um, 
if you're experiencing white guilt is because you haven't you're only half done with your education on these issues <clears throat> because if you are completely thorough about your learning um the ego is outside of outside of what happens next it doesn't it's not about you anymore it's about just creating a uh, positive change just getting involved in what needs to be done so um my response to that would be to just keep learning and the thing with white folks is that it is going to be an education for the rest of your life it's an education for me you know i, I still deal with my feelings of racism towards other people and towards myself i was raised in white english middle class suburbia um, I actually had really quite a nice childhood, but, um, you know, you, you have in England, certainly you sort of have to let go of your culture if you want to be able to progress in life, you know, and I think it's very, we really need to pay attention when folks of color are listening and making suggestions, um, because they have the benefit of having learned everything there is to know about your culture as well as their own so they have you know we we get condescended to a lot but actually we have a very very broad sense of what's going on um so i would say uh keep listening to folks of color let them lead because they already probably have the answers um that you're trying to develop from scratch and keep on your education just keep expanding keep learning you know there's the other thing about education and, and racism is that we sort of think we can educate our way out of everything but there are plenty of racist academics out there tons um in my experience the only way to really deal with these things is exposure to difference be friends with people that don't look like you, that don't um, fall in love with the same kinds of people, that aren't the same gender as you, um, different physical abilities. Like this is the only way we're getting out of this mess. It's not about you know helping out <laughs> people's egos um, and making people feel better. It's it's um, it's about being quiet, listening, and learning. Does that help? <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Tamali. Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hi, you OK? Um, I've just got a good, quick question. So it's just, you know, a lot of young people, I think when they get involved, they're not really sure where to start or what to read about and stuff. Um, so what would you say to young people, for instance, who are wanting to speak up about climate justice or learn about it, but aren't sure where to start? Oh, there are so many places to learn um i'm not a good reader so i i find it i find books really difficult but um but actually um there is a fantastic book that i'm going to recommend um youth to power by jamie margolin if folks don't know about it um she was the first um the, the founder of the first youth climate movement in the us um she wrote a book on how to um you know how to move forward with youth organizing and not just in climate in any in any issue that is important to you um but she's done really amazing things with that book and i know a lot of young people have found it really really powerful um i i i learn the most from talking to people so i think getting involved in community activism is such it's like a twofer you're learning on the go you're um you're a part of you're in a diverse community and um and you're taking action so i th i'm really big fan of that um but in terms of um books you know i would suggest mary's book climate justice where she talks to women all over the world um about their about their um, perspectives and on dealing with climate um, in their regions. Um, All We Can Save is a fantastic book that's just that's just come out from Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson. Actually, all of these people have been on our show, so I'm realizing we're doing quite well. Um, uh, but there, it's a series of essays from um, 
climate activists all over the US. Um, but th there is there are so many different ways. I'm going to obviously say Mothers of Invention. There are so many fantastic podcasts, climate podcasts out there now. Um, Hot Take with my friend um, Mary Alice Hegler is fantastic. Um, uh, Grist have come out with a new podcast called Temperature Check about race, climate and culture. That's fantastic. Floodlines, which was from the Atlantic, which sort of documents Katrina, how Katrina went down um, in a re very beautifully crafted, um, uh, you know, sort of mini series type thing. Um, yeah, I do think that pods are actually still the the go to media of choice because we can sort of get a bit messy in them. You know, we unfortunately film and TV well film a little bit, but um, TV certainly has not caught up at all. Um, but there are some very, very, very rich conversations that are happening on pods um, at the moment. So that would be my go to. I totally agree. And I love the way when you get into a certain podcast and you get to, you think, you know, the hosts, like I've always been like that since I was a kid. If, you, if I see someone I've, I've, I've seen, them <laughs> me, I think they know me too, but um, <laughs> podcasts, there, there's more of a sense of being invited into a conversation. You, you're hearing, it forms a network that you feel might, might be able to include you in that conversation. Yeah. It's funny you say that Kath, because I have, so, you know, as I said in the in the pod, you know, I, I write an editorial strategy and a social justice impact strategy in the way that we develop the show. But a part of that, um, yeah, I, in my work over the last two years is realize is sort of shifting the audience from being listeners into being community. You know, I really I'm really working hard to make sure, again, this issue of relatability um, that the audience see themselves as you know adjacent to the folks that we have on the show not underneath them like it's very important that people listening feel like they too are mothers of invention or are mothers of inventions in in training you know um i think it's really important to sort of inspire that kind of community um action got a lovely comment in the chat there from nicole i like to think of responses in my head as if i was part of the conversation and Jenny echoing that, so yeah, while listening. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, Maeve is, is my secret weapon for many reasons, but also because I feel like she is answer, asking the questions that perhaps people think, you know, people are probably thinking, but are too shy to ask, you know, because it is such a big issue now, we're supposed to know everything about it, and it gets a bit embarrassing around people who don't really know. But Maeve will just say it. She sort of feigns ignorance on the show, but actually she's so smart. <laughs> but it is, um, it's really, I think it's really helpful. The event just previous to this one in Green Week was a panel with four current and recent York St. John students who are involved in environmental volunteering and activism and careers. And one of the most powerful things one of them said was, you know, if you want to start getting involved, don't wait until you're an expert. You know, if we wait, if it was only the experts getting involved, there wouldn't be a climate movement. You know something, come together with other people who know something else, that, that kind of. Yeah, but it's, again, it's like messy, but it's fun. But, but you know, I, I was an art student for many years. I, 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 you know, I still try and constantly to practice my art making, but um, it's the joy, it's the exciting bit is the process, surely, is like, you know, having ha having all this information around you and connecting dots and making something beautiful out of it. Like, I can't emphasize enough as somebody who sort of grew up in a, in a culture where the arts were just the worst thing you could possibly do um, in my South Asian upbringing. Um, it took a long time to realize how important um, how pivotal artists are. Uh, and Mary says the exact same thing. You know, it's, um, please don't think that this movement belongs to scientists. It really doesn't. It belongs to absolutely everybody. It requires everyone's skill set. Um, because climate is affecting all aspects of our society. So um, it's important, it's imperative that you're there. It's imperative that you're there and you are important and critical to it. 
I think we've probably got time for one more question before we uh, just wind up a bit. Anybody's got anything they want to ask? Matthew, yeah. So I don't want to hog the question, but just following on from that last point that not being owned by scientists is, is the other narrative is, of course, that technology will save us all. Oh. Technological <laughs> cornucopian. And I, get, I mean, you put people very much at the centre, so so which is which is different. I'd wonder if you have any thoughts on that as the, the kind of other, particularly in the, in the media at the moment, I think, narrative. Oh, I'm really glad you said that. Yeah, I, I'm actually having, trying to have lots of discussions um, with various media makers as to what the sort of landscape for climate media could be in the next year to five years. Um, it's not been looking good. Uh, it's still uh, leagues behind uh, the UK. The US is leagues behind the UK, if that's reassuring to you guys. Um, Don't worry. <laughs> well, they, but there is there there is a lot of work being done um, thanks to organizations like Albert who are attached to BAFTA. Um, they have developed training courses for media makers, commissioning editors, directors, producers, all kinds um, to come and learn about how they can draw down carbon in actual literal productions, but also um, editorially how they can integrate um, climate storytelling in whatever genre they're, they're working in. Um, uh, my, my best mate, Mark School, actually she's a head of comedy at Channel 4, and I know that they're working really, really hard on um, integrating climate into um, new, new stories that they're coming up with. And, um, and I, I know other networks in the UK are doing the same. The US, unfortunately, is much further behind. Um, and I reflecting back what Matthew's saying, I, you know, my fear also is that as climate becomes a, a more a critical issue to everybody and people start recognizing the importance of it, that um, it gets taken over by the noisiest people or the richest people in the room who are going to go, yes, geoengineering. We're like, what? No. Um, because we've got folks like Elon Musk who are like, on Twitter being like, oh, I'll, I'll throw a few billion dollars or billion dollars, whatever, towards the first person who can come up with great best carbon capture technology. And then Twitter <laughs> writes back, uh, do you mean forests and trees? Because <laughs> we already have that. Um, we actually already have the best technology available. So um, again, I think pods have been doing, climate pods have been doing the, you know, the real grunt work on framing up the narratives um and so i'm really hoping that this gets adopted in, in film and tv film is also doing much better as well um mother's invention is actually produced by an organization called doc society who specialize in social justice um documentary film and and specifically social justice impact of those films um, and are working really very hard on developing climate media, not just in documentary film, which is sort of the, the realm that they are most um, known for, but various different media. So I'd also recommend if you're a storyteller, go on Doc Society's website and go and have a look at the things that, that they've got going on too. So Albert, if you're interested in media specifically and um, Doc Society for documentary film storytelling. Actually, that tees in really nicely to the sort of last thought, really, that that um, we were wanting to finish with. You mentioned, you know, your friend is working at Climate for a Comedy and sorry, Channel for a Comedy. Yeah. And that climate change is a key issue for her. You know, sometimes people thinking about careers, current students, future careers, think of there being a certain cluster of careers called climate careers. Yeah. Be a growing sector. But in fact, every career is potentially a climate career. It's it's, it's changing the shape of, of every sector. And um, wanted to think as a closing thought about what kind of skills young people graduating from York St. John need to have um, based on your experience of talking to different mothers of invention and any any kind of sources of inspiration for that, any young people you might have in mind as, as exemplifying that. Mm. I mean... I think 
in terms of of how I feel about young people, it's sort of illustrated in how I wanted to wrap up a very, you know, evocative, beautiful season three with um, a youth takeover episode. That was our final episode of the season. Um, so I had Mary Maeve and myself who handed off our microphones and gave them to um, to young people to take over to talk about what their hopes and ambitions and dreams and anxieties were and they can talk could talk amongst themselves um and so i had um Shia bastida who you may or may not know if you don't i highly recommend following her she's an absolute hero to me um she's a climate justice activist in new york city um, and she she took over for mary um but she's a lead organizer for Friday to Future, which is a youth climate movement. I'm sure everybody knows. Um, but she also works on the administration committee for the people's climate movement. So she actually gets to have a say on behalf of or, or uh, share the issues of students and young people with these enormous, you know, climate leaders all over the country. Um, so again, young people have influence, huge influence. People are listening. Um, and she founded her own organization, the Earth Initiative. So um, I, I think in terms of skill set, I think it's uh, that the, the foundations are actually already there. Like for people that are entering into this world, I think there are really highly, this highly comprehensive strategy coming out of youth climate movements and I would go and speak to them and learn specifically what areas um, are most needed. But I, I agree with you, Kath, it's across the board, it's every sector. Um, for example, at Albert, the gentleman who run, ran that project for years, founded it, I think, too, um, is a geographer, but working on developing these strategies for film and television. Like, it's, um, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. Thank you so much, Timali. It's wonderful to talk to you again and to be able to expand on some of the things, well, for me, that I've been thinking of since we recorded our podcast months ago um, and to hear other people's questions. Thanks to everybody for coming. And also um, to everybody who's been involved behind the scenes in organising the Green Week. It's just been an amazing collaboration. Thank you to Charlotte for also supporting this event and, uh, and hosting it. Um, on the tech side so um, keep an eye out for other events happening this week we're recording almost all of them so if you can't make it all of them in person they will be available on the Yorks and John YouTube channels and please please get involved in these ongoing conversations at Yorks and John there's various Twitter accounts for example uh, YSJ Equal Justice is mine there's also YSJ Social which is Matthews uh, YSJ Sustain and even YSJ Hedgehog if you've got a more specialised interest in nature on campus um, I think that's all uh, that I need to say to wind this up I don't know if you've got any final comments Charlotte on what what the week's been for you so far or uh, any any thoughts you'll be taking away from this yeah brilliant to get involved and lovely to hear from you as well and, and all of your insights as someone who's looking into going into career in sustainability it's really nice to hear that the you know the goal is to be positive and to look at things it's not all doom and gloom and that a career can be anything and it's what you make of it and hopefully all careers will end up having that sustainable element and and everyone should be involved in the sustainability discussion um and it's it's not just something we need to talk about here it has to involve everyone so yeah really interesting yeah yeah um yeah i i just again thank you so much for having me and I keep saying to Kath I'm so impressed with the work that's happening at York St John um and I would have loved to have had this um, depth of conversation and support in my arts um, degree. So um, it's really so um, energizing to be able to come and talk to you and, and see the level of commitment. And, um, and yes, please keep going. Again, if anyone wants to reach out to me, very welcome to. Um, but 
I'm, I'm really uh, proud of all the work that's, that's happening at York St John's, so thank you very, very much. Well, thank you. We will attempt to follow up the talk with action. Um, yes, definitely. <laughs> Please. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for coming and hope you enjoy any other Green Week events that you're attending. And thank you so much again to Mali. So welcome, Kat. Thank you very much.